Hello everyone. Welcome back to Fundamentals of Nano and Quantum Photonics. So this will be the last week of uh, my discussion on nanophotonics. So the next four weeks will be on quantum, photo, uh, quantum photonics. So to this week, I would like to talk about uh, atom cavity interactions. And then I'll also talk a little bit about uh, nano fabrication. Okay. So the idea is that so far we have looked at the basic uh, properties of the materials and then we looked at different cavities, photonic, uh, plasmonic cavities and dielectric cavities and so on. And what we can do with, the, uh, with these cavities. So now in this week we will try to understand how a cavity interacts with incoming photons. So that's a very interesting frontier of uh, nanophotonics. And we'll try to consider some of the basic uh, concepts in this. Okay. The first one, you know, we've already seen this in a different context, wherein we talked about the spontaneous emission, stimulated emission and absorption processes. We wrote the rate equations for that and the Einstein coefficients, right? So this, I think we did last week. So uh, I wanted to emphasize one particular aspect of it, which is the resonant, this is a resonant process. Okay. What do I mean by that? Let's say I have my uh, two level system like this. Okay. So even though I show this in excited state, basically I'm, this is a two level system. So E1, E2. Okay. If you have like, let's say like the valence band and the conduction band, then you have a band of states and there are the corresponding optical uh, signatures that you'll see. But for a moment, let's consider this as a two level system. Okay, if I have such a system, we talked about absorption process, which is captured by Einstein coefficient B12. And similarly, uh, so the absorption process essentially takes a photon, uh, sorry, atom which is in the ground state, and it will put the atom in the excited state. And simultaneously, the photon is extinguished. And the corresponding uh, opposite process is basically spontaneous emission, wherein you have an atom in an excited state that will emit a photon and immediately the for the atom will come down to a ground state so if i mean if you think about it what are these ground states and excited states right these are not uh, physically different i mean an atom can be in different states so essentially these ground and excited states represent the way the wave functions are distributed in an atom so think about it from the perspective of the particle in a box problem we have this first state second state and so on wherein the wave function is different so that we call as a different state and the energy is different for those states, right? The only difference is physically it can just be a simple atom. But let's say if the electrons are confined in the center, the wave function, right? That is the, the lowest state and then the highest states. If you have a spherical atom, the eigenfunctions will be slightly different, but you can still apply the same analogy of a particle in a box. So now, so we have these basic uh, states, right? Now, what do I mean by resonant process? So for that, let's say I'll consider a, a, a material like this, let it be a gas, and I subject it to a radiation with varying frequencies or energy. Okay. So now if I look at absorption, how will the absorption be in this scenario? So at a particular frequency, where your uh, h nu is equal to, let's say, uh, h nu equal to e2 minus e1, right? At that frequency, you'll have maximum absorption. And if you're detuned from that, okay, that means if you are away from it, let's call this as omega naught. Okay. If you are at, if you are detuned, let's say, that means I come with a, fro a frequency uh, less than omega naught. Okay. Slightly less than omega naught or slightly greater than omega naught. What happens? We see that the absorption very sharply falls. So in effect, what you're observing is in a resonant process, the maximum absorption occurs at E2 minus E1 equal to H nu. And then absorption quickly reduces. As uh, away from this, as you move away from the center, as H nu moves away from, let's say, omega naught. Okay. So this is a resonant process. Okay. And now one of the characteristic features of a resonant process is a line width. So if I look at this here, 
this I can calculate what is its FWH up. Okay, so look at this line width, or I'll call it FWH up. Okay, it's extremely narrow if you're looking at a gas gas absorption gases. Okay, is a uh, small for gases. For example, if you're looking at emission or absorption from a uh, sodium atoms. Okay. The nano, uh, the line width will be less than a nanometer, okay. So less than one nm line width, even smaller actually, okay. And uh, FWHM is larger for solids. For example, if I look at let's say gallium arsenide, it you'll never get a very sharp transition because you have bands and then there's a broadness of this, right? This can be even like thirty to forty nanometers or so on. If you have quantum dots, I think it will be less than you know twenty nanometers, twenty five nanometers or so. So these are very very uh, sharp. Uh, sorry, the line width depends on the type of system you are looking at. But in effect, you can think of any two level system as a resonant uh, system. Okay. Now, if you have such a scenario, Einstein uh, uh, description tells us what happens to the rates and all that. Okay. So what do we have? Let's say we have uh, two states, E one. And E two, there are two levels, and the population of those states are n one and n two. Okay. Now, what happens? Okay, if you look at any particular you know, Einstein description, you will see that let's say we start with some kind of a initial number of electrons in the no, no, initial of number of atoms in the ground state. Okay, so there is one n one zero, and you shine light. Okay, you will see that absorption happens, and uh, Einstein uh, relation tells us that. No, or Einstein coefficients are there, so we can write n one of t, the population of state one, as a function of time. I can write it as n one zero times exponential minus t by tau. Tau is my uh, time constant, one over a to one. Okay, so you'll see that the absorption, uh, the population in the ground state reduces as a function of time, but it doesn't really tell us much about how the system evolves with time. In the sense, you know, this tau is just the overall picture, phenomenological constant. But there's a lot more detail that we can observe, and for that we'll have to look at uh, the system a little bit closely. What we will do is, so we should recognize that these are essentially quantum mechanical states. So each level is a quantum mechanical state, okay, and it has a wave function, right? Represented by a wave function, function I'll call this wave function as n, the number the n state, right? First state, second state, and so on. So if you are having a two-level system, I can represent the overall wave function as psi equal to some c1 times first state plus c2 times second state. So you have two-level system. So this basically, this uh, one and two are the Dirac's kets ket notation. So Dirac came up with this bracket notation. So in this case, these are kets, okay, for wave functions, okay. And basically, this C one and C two are uh, the coefficients of it. So what this tells us is, let's think about it from the particle in a box perspective. You have this uh, discretization of energy levels that happens when you confine an electron to a small dimension, and those states can be represented by orthonormal states, which are basically they form a basis, right? So now uh, you can form any other state which is a superposition of it. So one and uh, wave function one, in this case ket one and ket two represent two states. Now you can also have a linear superposition of it, which is represented in this fashion. So this is a this should describe the complete uh, quantum picture, right? So in this case, whenever you can write a wave function like this, so what is the probability of finding an electron in the state one, right? So that will be the the coefficient square. So if I look at it, in this case, c one square and c two square represent. The probabilities of finding the system in a particular state, in a corresponding state, right? 
in the right so now so what <laughs> okay so what so to answer that let's consider a scenario wherein let's take a purely classical case in a classical system if you have this let's say the total number of atoms is n not and from that there are n n one number of atoms in the first state or ground state and two in the excited state okay so what is the probability of finding a atom in the n1 state or first state so c1 square in this case of a classical system will simply be n1 by n0 similarly the probability of finding a system in the excited state is going to be n2 by n0 okay so if because essentially what we are saying is it is simply a statistical mixture okay it just you know if you take a, let's say 100 atoms 40 atoms will be in state 1 60 atoms will be in state 2 or vice versa that's it okay there is no interaction between the atoms okay that's a classical situation wherein no interaction between atoms is considered now so we will we'll, you know in literature sometimes we call it a statistical mix mixture now if you are looking at quantum picture and we are looking at the wave functions of each individual atoms the wave function is also you know basically we we have seen how a wave function looks like for a particle in a box situation the wave function is let's say sine right and you have various periodicities of sine right you have seen those you know wave functions psi n pi x by sorry n pi x by a right so we can you know n will dictate what sort of wave functions you are looking at so i can write out even an exponential for it now suppose you can there exists you know if like phi 1 and phi 2 are the the phases associated with states and there is a fixed fi fixed phase relation between them that means if i have phi 1 minus phi 2 equal to constant okay if i have this sort of a scenario so essentially what we are saying is there is a fixed phase relation between the wave functions of state 1 and state 2 okay so we can we call that as a coherent superposition if you don't have this coherence you end up with a statistical mixture where n1 by n0 and n2 by n0 will be the probability densities but if you have a fixed fixed phase relation between the states then some interesting things will happen now one of the analogies that we can think about in this direction is no even though we have not discussed interference phenomena in our course but if you look at any basic optics course you would have seen interference effects wherein if i have two lasers coming in they will if, if two there are two different laser beams they will not interfere because there is no fixed phase relation between them so if i want to observe interference what we do is we take an inter, uh, beam initial beam and uh, make it pass through let's say two slits now because of the from the same source you are deriving these secondary beams they will interfere and then form this interference fringes that means there is a fi fixed phase relation between the beams so if you look at any particular position on the screen depending on whether the waves constructively add or destructively add you have these fringes that form okay that's the classical optical optics picture right interference so now what we are saying is if your wave functions also have some sort of fixed phase relation what will happen okay and to analyze that it requires a lot more theory than what we need so i'm not really going to describe any of it okay so if you want to analyze such a system we'll have to move to what is known as time dependent perturbation uh, time dependent schrodinger equation okay so when we solve the particle in a box problem that is a time independent schrodinger equation so we didn't take you know we said simply hsi equal to e psi right so basically hamiltonian applied on the wave function will give you the eigen value and the 
i can function that's it but now if you want to actually solve this so we'll have to take the time dependence into account and this is my uh, time dependent schrodinger equation i'll have to solve this so i'm not going to solve it or anything i'll just give you the final result with it okay so remember we talked about the the coefficient c1 and c2 for the wave functions right so now i can write an expression for the time dependence of the variation uh, time variation of these coefficients so what i can what i'm doing here is i'm just listing out that the coefficient c1 okay the time derivative of it is c d1 by uh, c sorry uh, d c1 by dt and that time dependence of c1 is going to depend on c2 okay the coefficient 2 uh, and i can also show that c2 is dependent on c1 okay so they are cross coupled systems essentially and it also makes sense you know for example what is the rate of change of population in let's say c1 it, it's it huh sorry in classical situations ha huh? sorry ha huh. that is the dk right uh, the, i mean let's say yeah if you look at it classically we n1 is based, we said c1 is effectively c1 square is going to be n1 by n0 so n1 is going to depend only on uh, exponential minus e tau right it decreases but the moment you are actually pumping it up then the probability of atoms in the excited state also is also going to influence finally so there's going to be some equilibrium situation so this is not one thing you know if you have a simple two level system and you keep pumping it there's going to be absorption and the opposite process emission and at some point they equilibrate eventually you'll end up with a situation which is i think if you have two level system it should be n1 equal to n2 equal to n0 by 2 equal number of atoms up and down if you have enough strong enough situation right now in this case what we are saying is we'll even go into finer details about it just one particular in a in a way we'll track what happens as a atom goes from the ground state to the excited state in time okay so that is dependent on this way. so wave function gives you at each instant of time that's an you know the classical picture is simply an average here it is basically you're tracking sort of each each uh, electron or you know each atom as it makes this transition so now in this expression one of the more important things is when you have things like you know this particular thing here is the transition frequency omega not i would say don't worry about too much the mathematics here but the the phenomena is interesting so this is a input frequency let's say immediately whenever you see this right i mean you know this is a thing that we have seen multiple times in our linear uh, linear differential equation so you get a sinusoidal solution so in effect what we are saying is if you have a system like this and you pump it you will see that the probability you know this c1 square here this is a c1 square here c1 square is dip is going sinusoidally as a function of time so down up and so this is a sinusoidal variation of probability of finding a system in the state 1 similarly there is you know a sinusoidal dependence of c2 as well so as the function so basically what's happening is if you turn on a beam the system initially has highest probability of finding uh, atoms in the ground state then with time the probability of finding the atoms in the ground state reduces and simultaneously the probability of finding a electro, uh, atom in the excited state increases at some point all the atoms are likely to be found in the excited state and then no atoms in the ground state right so if i have to look at this picture i can say that in this case c2 is the dashed one right so let's look at this point okay this is all atoms in ground state similarly here at the same point all atoms in excited state right and if i go in time different at a different time i'll find the scenario reversed so at this particular point of time you will see all the atoms are in the excited state and no atoms in the ground state so the probability of finding these atoms is changing as a function of time and it is varying sinusoidally and that particular frequency of oscillation of uh, probabilities is called as rabi frequency okay so this particular frequency is called as rabi frequency 
and essentially what it tells you is this particular frequency is dependent on the dipole moment mu 1 2 so here mu 1 2 is basically the transition dipole moment okay and e not is basically amplitude of incident electric field okay and so what we are noticing is as you apply a pulse or a light pulse the probabilities of finding the system in one and two states varies sinusoidally okay and that particular frequency we said is rabi frequency so that is why here if you look at it in the bottom uh you see here this is basically if i look at this this is basically the period of oscillation which is simply going to be 2 pi by omega r if i do 2 pi by omega r this is my period of oscillation okay how much is this period of oscillation well we can try to make an estimate we said rabi frequency is dipole moment times the electric field divided by h bar so what is the dipole moment if i take a atom atom let's say my dipole moment will be simply charge times a not a is the size of the atom let's say right so i can say this is almost equal to 1.6 into 10 power minus 19 into atomic size will be let's say few angstroms so i'll put it as 3 angstroms 3 or 10 power minus 10 right that's the unit of uh dipole uh, dipole moment okay 10 power minus 19 into 10 power minus 10 so 10 power minus 29 and let's say my initial amplitude is e not is 10 power 3 volt per meter so what will be my rabi frequency my rabi frequency will be simply omega r equal to uh 10 power minus 29 into 10 power 3 divided by h bar is roughly 10 power minus 34 so this is going to be about minus 29 this thing is right so 5 5 plus 3 8 so 10 power 8 radians per second okay that is my typical rabi frequency in terms of radians radians per second right so what will be my period my period of oscillation will be 2 pi by let's say 10 power 8 okay that will be how much 2 pi is 6.4 10 power 8 is uh, you know i can take it up so 10 power minus 8 so point uh, in this case it will be 0.6 nanoseconds okay the interesting thing is what happens to this frequency as you change the amplitude of electric field if i increase my amplitude of electric field okay so my rabi frequency is dependent on the electric field right if you increase that rabi frequency increases So the period of oscillation reduces. All right. When there are no coherent interactions, simply let's say the population is something, right? Let's say hundred atoms are hundred atoms are in the excited state. Okay. Now the spontaneous rate, let's say the time is two nanoseconds. Then after roughly two nanoseconds, the population will fall down to one over e. That's it. So it will basically decay down to ground state. if let's say somehow you created the initial time you had 10 100 atoms in the excited state after the radiative uh, rate one over if it takes spontaneous emission a21 coefficient i think we have given a problem in i think week 7 also wherein we said that a21 is let's say some uh, 10 power 8 or something like that and then 20 uh, 50 10 power 8 or something and then one over that will give you the time it will be 2 nanoseconds or something like that So, if you have two nanoseconds, after two nanoseconds, one over e population, so roughly you know sixty-seven or something, and then if you wait long enough, all the population will come back to ground state. There's nothing else. There is no oscillation that you can expect. If you don't have any coherent uh, addition, you know, then you don't expect oscillations. So, 
the question was so is it is it a scenario where you are continuously exciting the answer is no you think of a scenario wherein you know let's say i mean i can't of course you know if i say that without atoms i can't excite them let let me take it you know in a situ- situation the initial state is that the excited state has population of 100 okay so if you are looking at a simple spontaneous emission process i told you that after a time 2 nanosecond the population decays and nothing can be done about it but what happens if your ravi oscillations are fast enough then the population of higher state will be 100 and it will drop down to zero and all the atoms will come down to zero but then again they'll go back up and down and up so on so basically you have this variation of population as a function of time okay now uh, your question i think will become clearer in this situation okay so basically uh, the idea is let's say you have this ravi frequency right and the time period let's say is you know 2 pi by omega r is my time period of oscillations and let's say somehow you know i made this as 20 nanoseconds okay and my uh, lifetime of the state let's say is upper state is let's say tau r is about 2 nanoseconds now will we see ravi oscillations we will not because before even you can observe the ravi oscillations the excited state has decayed okay so basically in this scenario what's happening in this particular combination right excited state population decays before ravi oscillations can occur okay why do they decay why 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 do the ravi oscillation not, not uh, they can why cannot they complete because the decay is happening what is the source of the decay so well yeah so basically the reason for this is uh, due to due to damping i can say and the source of this damping is twofold one is your regular spontaneous emission so population decay okay so basically there is a lifetime associated with the upper state and they will decay that's it so in some way they are they are leaking out so you can think of this as some sort of oscillation occurring but each time the oscillation occurs some of it actually decays out right it's emitting uh, randomly into you know spontaneous emission so random process okay now you can also have another sort of uh, damping mechanism that is basically your uh, dephasing we call it so basically if you have let's say if it's a system there are some phonons there's an ex- ex- uh, there's a collision the some collision happens and the collision didn't really change the number of atoms in the excited state but only change the phase of it that will also cause some sort of damping so in effect we can think of what happens to ravi oscillations as a function of uh, a metric which is gamma by omega r so basically i can define let's say this de- uh, damping i can if i call it as gamma i can define basically gamma by omega r which is a ratio of the damping to the ravi frequency if you have zero damping okay the first scenario that we just discussed last time right you have this perfect oscillation of uh, populations will occur okay so that is this particular first case damping is zero or negligible okay or i mean not not zero it's not not negligible zero damping this is basically no damping okay now let's say there is some amount of damping okay moderate damping wherein my damping coefficient is 0.1 times the omega r if damping coefficient was 10 times omega r what happens just quickly just decays nothing will be seen but in this case damping coefficient uh, damping rate not coefficient damping rate right damping rate is 0.1 times omega r so if omega r was omega r ravi frequency was 1 gigahertz let's say the damping rate was 100 giga, 100 megahertz so i can see some oscillations so second term you see here is this initially there is a increase in population and reducing this is oscillation of populations so if i look at the probability right this is c2 so that means excited state probability is going to vary initially as something but overall it damped okay think of it like you know if you have a if you are familiar with electric uh, systems right it's rc or lc lc resonators 
there is an l and c because of its oscillation occurs from you know capacitor to inductor the energy keeps oscillating exactly same plot you will see correct energy entirely in capacitor energy entirely in inductor but if there is a resistance that's going to dissipate some amount of energy overall there is going to be a decay of energy so now in a similar analogy you can think of this as you have the lower state excited state populations okay if you have completely zero damping perfect nice you know it just goes up and down up and down forever okay but that cannot happen there is going to be some i mean it, it let's say if you go to a higher state right all of them will not come down to the ground state what will happen some of them can be randomly emitted without any proper phase so that will cause dephasing and then it will just basically reduce the overall limit okay the question was where is energy going if the excited state population is changing up you know it's you know let's say c2 probability is up down and up right so whenever the excited state has to come back down to ground state essentially you are emitting a photon and that photon is getting reabsorbed and then it's going back up but in we know in real life it can never be such a scenario there is going to be some loss of photons if they escape from the system then over that's it it's irre irreversibly lost if the photon is completely lost from the whatever you know system then that loss is anyway there if it's not lost and somehow it's able to again absorb back and then the ground state can go back up to excited state okay so what happens is if you have moderate damping uh there is basically some up some amount of uh, oscillations observed right in this case of uh, moderate damping here oscillations are damped okay and if i go to the even more damping let's say gamma is uh, the rate is damping rate is equal to the rabi frequency then i'll see that there are no oscillations at all there is some you know the excited state will have some small probability i mean this is actually same thing that if you look at the theory it will turn out to be the same thing that you will get from einstein equations so it'll just be some probability up and probability an excited state some in the lower state that's all over okay now let's say here in this case third state no oscillations observed okay what does it mean now how can we observe oscillations now if you're not seeing because damping rate is very high so essentially in this case damping gamma equal to omega r right now i have to somehow if i want to see it i have to increase my omega r if if i if i increase my omega r somehow then i'll make my oscillations happen faster then before they can come irreversibly be lost from the system i can observe something so how will i increase my uh, omega r electric field has to increase okay so why this is happening the oscillations are lost is basically uh, uh let's say this is due to weak electric field field right basically implies that omega r is small right and my uh, time period for oscillation is long in this scenario i cannot observe rabi oscillations but suppose somehow i manage to increase my intensity so the electric field is large and then i'll immediately see that my uh, oscillations can occur okay so it turns out that uh, rabi oscillations can be seen under high electric fields all right 